All right, let's talk about Dark Side of the Ring. Oh, right, yes. Um, I watched, obviously, I watched the Dynamite, but I also went back and watched the Pillman. And, and it was... The, the biggest thing that struck me, and, and I actually talked to Jerick about afterwards and he reminded me, it's how dark the industry used to be like when you when you the you know the dynamite thing with with Jacques it's like it started with with Hennig cutting up guys gear and blaming other people and it's like ribbing and messing with people and screwing with people and trying to create conflict that you know led to you know a very very vicious assault and probably if you know Jacques hadn't have uh uh, did the the fake mafia threat? It's like you know what would have dynamite's retaliation would have been that it's just horrifying and it, it's I'm curious how many people that are currently in the industry, which is obviously much more pleasant and safe than it used to be, um, what they think or even if they know how dark and crazy the business was. Like when I broke in in Stampede, it's like that was you know practically the only thing Keith Hart talked to us about was you know, the perils of avoiding getting ribbed. And it's something that I still do today out of habit. My wife mentions it every once in a while, where it was one of the things Keith told me. He's like, if you ever go anywhere, have keep your hand over your drink so that the top of your glass is always sealed if you're not drinking out of it because someone's going to pill you. And, you know, they mentioned it in the Dynamite docu uh, documentary about uh, him. I don't remember the, the name of the guy that they... Uh, pilled up and you know went in and crapped in his bag and it's like i've heard horror stories from stampede where where they managed to you know halcyon a guy and did all kinds of horrible things to him and that was like a regular occurrence and it's like <laughs> the business has come so far and it's it's just so horrifying and, and even worse because it bothered me because it's like I, I knew kurt hennig and liked him and he was a fun ribber when I saw him in the 2000s, but obviously was a, a much more um, evil conniving ribber back in the day because he not only was the one that started the heat between the Rougeaus and Dynamite, but he, you know, clearly set up Jacques to get suckered by Dynamite behind with the card game. And it's just like, man, I'm so glad locker rooms like that don't exist anymore. Things are much different now. I mean, you're still going to get a rib here or there. And maybe there are more than I know of, but certainly not like the old days. I hated leaving my stuff anywhere. I didn't trust anybody. And No, uh, I actually got heat for that. Because I broke in in Stampede, again, that was like you don't leave your bag anywhere. I had actually had a like a hard suitcase that locked. So when I went to Europe uh, for CWA Catch, I took that with me. And... You know, we had one big locker room, and I would open my bag, change, throw all my shit in the bag, close it, and lock it. And they were not happy with this uh, lack of trust. And I remember, it turned out it was Anthony Durante who had done it, but I got back from my match one time, and my suitcase was wrapped with about, you know, 15 feet of, you know, really thick chain, like the thick chain that Hercules would use back in the Hercules Hernandez days, wrapped around my suitcase and through the handle, locking it to the bench that it was in the locker room. And I had just enough space that I could open it and slide my hand in so I could get my stuff out of it, but I couldn't get my bag <laughs> unchained from the 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 locker room bench and since we were in the same building the whole time we were there like for two months i put up with the inconvenience of my gear bag being chained for two months and when we had to move on to uh that was vienna so we moved on to hanover afterwards i was like what am i gonna do if no one unchains my suitcase and thankfully, the last day, the bag was no longer chained to the bench, but it still had all the chain wrapped around the suitcase through the handle. So when I had to go to Hanover and travel, I had about an extra, you know, 25 pounds of chain wrapped around and locked to the outside of my suitcase. And I think everyone must have who saw me thought I was just some insane paranoid guy with, you know, millions of dollars in his in his suitcase because he had this gigantic chain locking his suitcase closed. 
What about uh, Pillman? Yeah, it was it was interesting, but it was, it was also very very sad. And, and well, I thought the documentary was good. The the one thing that, and again, I have a different moral compass than others do, and, and people in the business seem to accept infidelity more than I do. But I was really left not liking him, to be honest, that I was just dumbfounded by the statement. I guess it was uh, Kim Wood that, again, I don't know if he was married to um, the mother of his middle child, um, the daughter, but it's like he seemed to be in a happy relationship with the woman. He's got kids and it's like he sees a picture of Melanie in a Playboy or a penthouse magazine and goes, I'm going to marry her. It's like while he's in a loving relationship with a kid, and it's like, what? And then he actually manages to go out and meet her and marry her, which is a uh, a hell of an accomplishment, I guess. But it was just it was just a really sad story. And it was interesting that Pillman very much was it's all about the job and getting the contract and the money, which I actually respect because it's just the professionalism of this is my job. I'm making money where so many wrestlers are, you know, I want the push. I want the title. I want the fame. And he was like, I need to go wherever I get the most con yeah, the best contract. And his obsession with just working the industry to get that contract, I found very fascinating, but I also did. And again, it's a different generation of the business. You mentioned it quite a bit about, you know, the wrestlers being clean, you know, they, well, they still have a gigantic steroid habit, but they're no longer on whatever pill they OD'd on, so they're clean now. But it was interesting, and I think it was Melanie, when they talked about the Hummer accident, and, you know, the interviewer asked, it's like, could he have been, you know, medicated? And she's like, no, 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 no. Well, he might have been on some muscle relaxer or something. It's like, yeah, he would have been on Somas. <laughs> he it's might have been on a muscle relaxer, but he wasn't medicated. That yeah. that That non-medical muscle relaxer drug. Yeah, and obviously knowing the year and knowing the industry, it's pretty much a guarantee that he was on Somas. Because she even mentioned that he might have mistimed, because that was something I didn't fully understand until I witnessed it, because I wasn't a drug guy. But on a couple occasions I did, where back when Somas were a big problem in the industry, the guys would take them and time them to when they thought they'd get back to their hotel, so that when they got to their hotel, they would pass out and go to sleep and, and sleep through the night. And occasionally you have the guy, you know, fall face first into his food at the restaurant because he took it too soon or quite probably in the case of Pillman fell asleep at the wheel because he took it too soon or the other where they didn't uh, wake up or kick out in time. And then you've got them, you know, walking through the airport with the, sh the Soma shakes and you're trying to keep the person coherent until he manages to, uh, you know, kick out, so to speak, and, and function again. And it's just amazing on, I guess, being reminded on how bad that culture was in the business when you go back, you know, 30 and 40 years. MJF now has a cryptocurrency. Yes. I have never purchased a cryptocurrency in my life. I bought $100 of MJF coin. All right. And I'm watching it in like, in, in two minutes, it had gone up like five bucks, ten bucks. I had to put in another 150 bucks. And all throughout the day, I've been watching it. It's kind of addictive. I'm sure it this, is. This money growing thing. Yeah. There are weekly awards. So basically, this would be like dividends. So all of the people that have purchased this uh, MGF coin, they're all in like this big pool. And then I don't even understand how this works, but like awards are given out and you're given a portion uh, depending on how much of this MGF coin that you have. My dividends right now, if this is accurate, I am over $3,000 right now for my $250 investment. Wow. I know I made more on this than Cameron Grimes made on GameStop. Sure. I am in fact going to the moon with this MGF coin here. I don't know how long it'll last. I mean, for, it actually is going to last forever because I don't even know how to get the money back. I don't know how to get my money out. <laughs> you couldn't cash out if you wanted to. You don't appear to be able to get the cash back. No. So, that, that seems like a major bug well, in the Well, I mean, system. there's a way, I'm sure. It's like you got to... Are you? Well, I've been told you have to convert it to this other thing. And then once it's converted to the other thing, then you can convert it to another thing. 
And then you can like, but it can be done is the point. But it's easier. To but I don't know there. how it's easier to just never look at it again. If you enjoy these videos for just $7.99 per month, you can enjoy full length editions of the Brian and Vinny show, Wrestling Observer Live, Figure Four Daily with Tom Lawler and Lance Storm. The Mad Men Podcast, Speak Now Pro Wrestling with Denise Salcedo and more, plus hundreds of archived shows, all in beautiful HD. Don't miss out. Join us today.